Por isso. Yeah. Ok. Whenever you want. Ok, so thanks a lot for the, giving me the opportunity to give a talk in Edinburgh. Anyway, uh, <laughs> at some point. Uh, so the talk is uh, about mostly about joint work with Matthias Jonsson. And uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, I, I changed the, the title slightly to make it a bit more specific, I mean, more closer to the actual content. So it's uh, case stability from filtrations to non-Archimedean pluripotential theory. But it will be <clears throat> quite a lot about filtrations, actually. Uh, so let me start with the, <clears throat> the setup. So we, we are working over an algebraically closed field K that doesn't need to be characteristic zero most of the time. Some people care about that. And X is a projective variety, which doesn't need to be smooth or even normal for, for the moment. And L is a fixed ample line bundle in the whole talk. So let me briefly <clears throat> recall stuff that probably everybody knows, given the, the name of the conference, but uh, I mean, just to set up some notations. Uh, so test configuration script L for the given line bundle. That's a shorthand for a degeneration script X of X. It's a G GM equivalent degeneration over A1 plus the line bundle, or in fact, a Q line bundle script L which I would assume to be ample over script X, and it extends the given polarization over the fiber over one, say. And I also assume always that my test configuration is so not quite normal because X doesn't have to be normal itself, but integrally closed in its generic fiber, which would mean exactly normal if X, uh, when X is normal, right? So it's just a small point. So you can think normal if you prefer. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I, I, did, I would denote by T the, the set of all such test configurations because it will show up quite a lot afterwards and we will try to embed it in various other sets and complete it and so on. Uh, so as, as I said, I guess everybody is familiar with that, that X L is K semi-stable if a certain invariant attached to script L, which doesn't really matter uh, I mean, it's in its precise formulation here, like <clears throat> in environment, which DFL is non for all test configurations, L of L, and uh, XL is further said to be K stable if this vanishes only on a, when L is trivial in a, in a suitable sense. <clears throat> Okay, and uh, now, now we have this notion of uniform case stability, which basically goes back to the PhD thesis of Gabor Sekeleidi and was uh, further on, maybe made a bit more precise and specifically studied by uh, Rui Darvan and independently by me and Matthias some years ago. So uniform case stability means that the, this donaldson futak invariant is not only required to be positive on non-trivial test configurations, but actually bounded below by a positive multiple of a certain norm type quantity attached to L that detects uh, trivial ones. It vanishes only on the trivial ones. Uh, okay, uh, so now let, let me move on to filtrations. So filtrations in this setting were uh, hinted at as being a possible generalization of test configurations, I guess, by goes back to David uh, Wittnerström originally, and then it was emphasized uh, more consistently <clears throat> and systematically by uh, Gabor Sekeleidi again. Um, so here we denote by R the, the, the ring of sections of L, so it's a graded ring, and the graded pieces are sections of ML, which means L to the M in tensor power notation. And uh, we denote by script F, the set of graded filtrations F on R. So here it means the following thing. So filtrations will have a number of uh, properties that are required, plus some extra ones that I will may or may not hold. So there will be quite a few adjectives around, but we will try to use notation that make it reasonably clear to, to follow, hopefully. 
So filtration uh, here, it means a multiplicative, decreasing filtration indexed by the reals. So it's a real filtration of, of the ring R, or, or more precisely the K algebra R. Uh, there is some left continuity of the filtration, but it can jump to the, to the right. <clears throat> And we impose that it's a graded filtration. That, that means that it's compatible with the grading of R. Uh, and also we impose some boundedness or linear growth condition, which is that the filtration is the whole space Rm when you restrict to Rm for lambda sufficiently negative, but controlled linearly in terms of M. And similarly, the, the filtration becomes trivial because it's decreasing. It want it to become zero at some point, but that point should be at most linear, a linear function of M. Uh, now we say that the filtration is homogeneous if it satisfies this condition that if, if you want to test if you lie in F lambda you, for a section L, S, you can just test it as well for some power of S. So it's some, some sort of integral closedness property for F in fact. And we denote by F hum the, the set of homogeneous uh, graded filtrations. It fits inside of script F. Then we say that uh, a filtration F has finite type if the, the associated grade ring, which is written here, so you know that we, we have less continuity, but on the right, F lambda plus means the thing that happens exactly to the right of F lambda, so it may or may not jump. And uh, this way, you get the graded ring attached to, to F. You want this, this uh, K algebra to be finitely generated. So the F, FT for finite type, of course, is the corresponding subset of script F. And finally, we say that a filtration, a filtration is rational if the only interesting values, which are the ones that occur in the graded, uh, <clears throat> in the graded object, so the ones for which you do have a jump, between F lambda and F lambda plus. So you want that only to happen when lambda is rational. And then FQ is the corresponding subset of filtrations. So in fact, in, in our work with Matthias, we rather view filtrations here as uh, norms on Rm or on, on R that are compatible with the trivial absolute value on, on, on the, the, the ground field K. And the two things are completely equivalent, but so here, I decided to choose the language which is most familiar probably to, to people still in case stability. Uh, and now we have this page result, which relates durations and, and uh, filtrations. So as I said, it basically goes back to, to David's work, David Wittnischström. And uh, I guess it's also in some it was, let's say, made, made a bit more explicit, maybe in a joint work with uh, Tomoyuki Hisamoto and Matthias some years ago. So it, in this language here, in, in the, the present uh, formalism, it, it says that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between test configurations as I've defined them, so they, remember that they are required to be normal or at least integrally closed, uh, and filtrations that are uh, of finite type, uh, homogeneous and rational. Uh, okay, so this way we see how test configurations sit inside of the space of all filtrations that they have to satisfy these three properties. And here you have the explicit definition of the filtration. It's not, basically, it's basically in the, the spirit of the way you, do, you attach a norm to a lattice in periodic geometry in, in case that rings a bell for some people. So if you have a QP vector space and you have a ZP module in it, which generates it, it it's a lattice, and then you have a corresponding norm. And it's, it's exactly the same idea that you use here. So if you want to take a section in RM and because it's a test configuration, you can view it as a rational section on the test configuration. And you want to see which power of, of T, which is the base, the coordinate on A1, you have to multiply the section width in order to make it uh, a holomorphic or reg regular section of script L. And this is what the filtration is measuring. OK. Uh, and because of, of that, we can interpret more general, slightly more general. If you drop the rationality requirement, you, you look at filtrations which are finitely generated and homogeneous, but maybe not rational, then this is more or less exactly what uh, Dervan and Sekeleidi and also 
Chile and Han have, have called a, a real test configuration. This is a sort of irrational test configuration. And, and they've been showing up when people look at uh, optimal uh, destabilizing test configurations, for example, or they study the asymptotic behavior of, of the Ketterichi flow. So that stuff actually originates in the work of Chen, Sun, and Wang about that. The Kedarichi flow in the limits on Fano in the Fano case, and you, you get this kind of filtrations, these sort of real test configurations naturally in, in that setting. Okay, uh, there is also an interesting and simple relationship between filtrations and valuations. So, here I'm mentioning that also because valuations will show up again a bit later in the talk. <clears throat> so uh, I will denote by x val the set of real valuations or simply valuations on the functional field of x that are required to be trivial on k. Uh, then we say that uh, such a filtration has linear growth if the vanishing order of, uh, of a section of, of uh, m times l, so a section in Rm, is at most linear grows at most linearly with respect to M. And this, in fact, you can show does not depend on the choice of the polarization. So it's, it, it uh, singles out an interesting subset of uh, this, the set of all valuations, which I didn't know by X lin. So this was considered, for example, in a paper of mine with uh, Kuronia, McLean, and Thomas Schoenberg. <clears throat> Um, on the other hand, we have this well, the well-known set of valuations that are sometimes called the geometric valuations, or more precisely, the divisorial ones. They are the ones that are attached to a divisor on a rational model and multiples, rational multiples of these. And this gives you uh, a subset of divisorial valuation x div. And these ones have uh, linear growth. This follows from sort of degree computation, for example. <clears throat> you can see that a section of ML cannot vanish too much along a given divisor because you can bound by the degree, basically. And because of that, x div sits in x lin, which itself was a subset of x val. Uh, okay, now uh, every time you have a valuation, you can evaluate it on, on, on sections of a line bundle. So if you want to do that in a reasonably canonical way, you trivialize the line bundle at the center of the valuation, and you can make sense of v of s. And then you can filter uh, the space of sections Rm by uh, this vanishing order. So it gives you a natural filtration of uh, the ring R of sections. And now if you want uh, this filtration to have the linear growth condition that we imposed before, the, this boundedness condition that was in the definition before of a filtration for us, then uh, this amounts to requiring exactly that the valuation V is, has this linear growth condition we introduced before. So X lin will sit, inject in a natural way in, in the set of homogeneous filtrations. What you get here is a homogeneous filtration. If you replace S by some power, it just comes out, uh, V of S to the R is just R times V of S. Because of that, you can see the, this homogeneity property very easily. <clears throat> okay, uh, now if the valuation happens to be to have rational values, for example, if it's a divisorial valuation, then the filtration you get is a rational filtration, naturally enough. And uh, in fact, by definition, the corresponding filtration is, uh, finite, is a finite type exactly when V is what uh, Kento Fujita has poetically called a dreamy. I mean, maybe not. Well, okay, so let's let's use this terminology anyway. So V is dreamy uh, if the filtration is a finite type. And that's again a condition which does not depend on the polarization. And uh, okay, but now we've seen before that um, <clears throat> so the space of, so if V is dreamy, that then it corresponds to a finite type, homogeneous and rational filtration. And that's the same as a test configuration. And you can ask which, what can you say about this test configuration? This is more or less answered in our paper by uh, Isamoto uh, with Isamoto and Janssen and made more precise and more explicit in a recent paper by Dervan and Legendre. And it, it can be stated like that, that you have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the dreamy evaluations and the test configurations that are so-called special. This is the term that was introduced by Chili and Chen Yangshu, 
in the setting in the Fano case, but it makes sense in the general case. So here you want this, the special fiber, the central fiber X naught, to be a variety, so irreducible and reduced. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, now I'm moving to uh, uh, introducing a metric, which is, there will be in fact two metrics on the space of filtrations. This is the first one, this is the more natural or maybe the more intuitive one, the D infinity metric. Uh, so there, there's a natural metric that D infinity on the space of filtrations, which is defined by the form formula you can see here. So if you formulate things in terms of norms, maybe it looks a bit more natural in the end. But anyway, uh, we've been requiring that the filtration uh, satisfies this boundedness condition that we saw before, this linear growth condition, which amounts to say that uh, it, <coughs> it, it, it's comparable up to this translation by a, a linear multiple of M to the trivial filtration. And now if you have, so it means that if, if you have any two such bounded filtrations, you will be able to compare, compare them up to translation by a linear multiple of M in this way. So they will be included into one another up to this translation. And then you can look at the best constant and that's the distance between the two filtrations. So this is indeed symmetric, obviously. And uh, if this is zero, then the two filtrations are equal. And triangle inequality is not it's pretty straightforward uh, as well. Another thing which is not too hard to check, especially if you take the norm point of view, is that this is in fact complete. So that's a complete, it's a complete vector space, uh, metric space, sorry, uh, with respect to the D infinity <clears throat> metric. And homogeneity of a filtration will be a closed condition. It cuts out a closed subset. It sits as a closed subset. And there is also a sort of projection or retraction onto it, which is the operation of taking a filtration and associating to it in a continuous way, in fact, Lipschitz's way with respect to the infinity, uh, it's homogenization. So I don't make it explicit, but it's, once you know it exists, it's quite easy to come up with a limit formula for that. Uh, and uh, okay, so then we have this nice way of passing from non, possibly non-homogeneous filtrations to homogeneous ones. And as I mentioned before, homogeneity can be thought of as a sort of integral closedness condition on the filtration. So homogenization is basically taking the integral closure. And I think it's more than basically it can really be made precise if you adopt the right point of view. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Okay, now we saw just uh, one slide ago that the space of valuations x lin with linear growth sits as a subset of uh, the space of filtrations f, if, in fact, of the homogeneous ones, where you filter by the vanishing order along the valuation. And so uh, you get an induced metric, d infinity of v, v, v prime, which is the distance between the two filtrations. And you can rewrite the formula in this nice way. So you, you compare vanishing order of sections of Rm along V and V prime. And well, then you have this, you, you could take the soup over M and in fact, it turns out to be equal to the limit because of some super additivity property and the Fekete lemma. <clears throat> and if you change the line bundle, this metric will not change very much. So it will only change up to multiplicative uh, constants. So, I mean, you get something which is well-defined up to Lipschitz equivalence of, of metrics. So it's, you have an intrinsic metric geometry for the space X lin. Uh, okay, now interesting, interestingly enough, if you, you, ha you had this subset of uh, finite type filtrations inside of F, they, they basically correspond to test configurations, maybe irrational ones. And it's quite natural to take the closure in the big set F. And you, you might think that this is in fact, dense in F, so you get the whole space. But it turns out, and that follows in fact, I mean, the example I, I would know follow from the, the more thorough study in terms of pluripotential that, that follows later. But anyway, uh, I guess you can look up an explicit example beforehand. So any, what I'm saying is that this closure 
which we call quasi finite type filtrations of quasi finite type that are uniform limits of finite type once FQFT. This is not the whole set F. So you get a strict closed subset. And uh, okay, now we had this, the, the space T of test configurations, which uh, is, remember, it identifies with the space of finite type and homogeneous and rational ones. And then you can show that its closure uh, with respect to this D infinity metric will identify with this set here. So the ones that are quasi of quasi finite type, so limits of finite type ones that are also homogeneous. And as I said, this is also for the same reason, homogeneous or not, it's, it's a strict subset of F hum as soon as X has dimension at least one. So you get this special class of filtrations here Quasi-finite type, we could call them con continuous filtrations. This, this is maybe more, this closer to what we will see later in terms of uh, functions on the space evaluations. And uh, it, it's an interesting <coughs> subset to study anyway. Okay, now we introduce uh, a different metric, which is a sort of L1 geometry on the space of filtration. So in fact, there is a DP metric for any P, but um, just looking at the two extremes because they are the two more relevant ones, especially for what we want to do. So remember that we had the L1 norm in the, in the formulation of uniform case stability. And the L1 norm is basically the D1 uh, length of, of a filtration. It's, it's some sort of, D1 up to uh, translating by a constant. So anyway, this is the D1 metric is, is the one which is more relevant for the problem of uniform case stability. So we pick two filtrations again, two graded filtrations. Well, I wrote norms, but I, I guess I meant filtrations somehow. Um, and I did not by FM the restriction of the given filtration to RM, the mth graded pieces. So this is a space of sections of ML. Now, a filtration on vector space like that, it's basically, it's a very simple object. It's just a flag of subspaces, plus some real numbers that tell you for which parameter lambda you have a jump in the flag. Okay, so in particular, as for any flag, you, have a, you can pick a compatible basis in RM so that the, the flag elements are generated by a subset of the basis. And then this determines for you this jumping values, lambda mi, so the sequence where of lambdas where this is jumping. And this is well defined. This is independent of the choice of compatible basis. In fact, it turns out up to uh, perm permutation. So if you order them in some way, they will be intrinsically defined. It's a kind of spectrum or eigenvalues or, or successive minima, whatever you want to call them of, of the filtration. Uh, and now if you have two filtrations, F and F prime, then you have a notion of relative spectrum of one filtration with respect to the other. So what you do is that you pick, it's not, it's not a difficult exercise in linear algebra to show that two flags admit a, a, com a compat jointly compatible basis, some, a basis that works for both of them at once. If you have three, it's not true, but two, you can, you can do it. And it, it's kind of uh, analogous to the fact that you can jointly diagonalize uh, or well, diagonalize uh, <clears throat> two quadratic uh, forms, positive ones or positive definite emission forms, for example. It's kind of analog of that. And so you picked a compatible basis for both of them at once. And you have the numbers lambda mi, which uh, and lambda prime mi that come out of this construction. And now you take differences. And this is the relative spectrum of the two filtrations. So again, you can show that it, it, this sequence, if you order it in decreasing order, for example, uh, it's characterized by some min max formula, exactly like what you have for quadratic forms. And in, in particular, it's independent of the choice of a jointly compatible basis. Okay, and now the, the very interesting thing here is that, uh, so this is just a discrete set of points, the relative spectrum, but now we have filtrations FM on each graded piece RM. And, uh, and you can show, so this goes back to the work of 
Chen and Maclean. So for, for just one filtration, it's something I did with uh, Huai Chen uh, a while back, and then they extended it to two filtrations. In fact, they've been working, they were working with uh, non-Archimedean norms in a much more general setting. And their result proves that the, the re re relative spectra of Fm and F Fm prime as n goes to infinity, it could distribute, it converge to some measure that describes the distribution in the limit. And that's a compact, compactly supported probability measure on R with uh, a lot of very nice properties. I mean, at least if you have only one filtration, there's some kind of log concavity attached to it and so on. Uh, so that's the object that encodes the, the asymptotic behavior of the two graded norms with respect to one another. <clears throat> okay, uh, and now we have the following results. It's a two parts, three parts. In fact, the, the third one is a consequence of the second one. Uh, so the first part says that if you uh, look at the first absolute moment of this uh, spectral measure, so the, the L1 norm of the identity lambda uh, against this measure, then uh, this is a non-negative and symmetric quantity, obviously, of f and f prime. But you can show that it satisfies the triangle inequality. This is what something we proved with, in a paper with uh, Denis Eriksson. So it's not trivial, because if, as I said before, if you have three norms, you cannot jointly diagonalize I mean, three filtrations. I mean, you cannot jointly uh, you can you cannot pick a compatible basis for all three of them at once. This is a bit too much to ask for. So there is a projection argument hidden here, which is very very close to what people do when they uh, when they define the a metric on on a Euclidean building. It's it's closely related to this sort of constructions, in fact. And so you get a pseudo metric. It's it's like a metric, but maybe it does not satisfy the separation axiom. Now, if you restrict to a finite type filtrations, which as we saw before, are basically irrational test configurations, then you can be more precise. So if two points are, uh, lies, lie at zero distance with respect to this metric D1, then in fact, the, the, the filtrations are uh, equivalent in a very strong way. So here you have this equivalence. You can compare them up to translation by a constant. But as opposed to what we saw before, the, the constant doesn't depend on m. It's, it's a uniform one once and for all. So it's much better than having a, a constant that grows linearly with respect to m, of course. And now, if the two uh, filtrations are furthermore rash, uh, homogeneous, then you can get rid of the constant altogether by uh, passing from rm to uh, r to time uh, to. Uh, R index a multi large multiple of M, you will kill the constant C. And so what you get in the end is that D1 is, is indeed uh, an honest metric on finite type and homogeneous filtrations, which again, for the sake of repetition, uh, I insist that this is the set of <coughs> uh, R real test configurations. So you get, you get a natural D1 geometry on the set of real test configurations. We had we had the infinity before, but the infinity it's very it's more uh, as I said it's more intuitive, but it's it's too strong with respect to case stability. You don't want to work with the n infinity norm; you want the L one norm. Uh, okay, and so well, what I'm saying here is something I said before. So then D one in particular on the set of, of test configurations, D one gives a metric. And this metric is very closely related. And it determines, in particular, the L1 norm. So before. Okay. So now we, uh, I move on to a different kind of objects, which are the, the objects we are, we are working with in non-Archimedean pluripotential theory. There are certain functions that we like particularly well because of their resemblance with very well understood metrics or functions in complex geometry. But there are functions on the space of valuations. So these we call Fubinish 2D functions. Uh, so this is just what people do in Berkovich geometry. You, you take a section of ML and you have a valuation V. So you can make sense of V of S, the vanishing order of S along V. And for some reason, you want to turn that into a multiplicative object. So you use this norm notation, absolute value of S on V is e to the minus V of S. Why not? 
And what you get this way, by the way, is uh, something. So this absolute value of S will indeed resemble uh, an ultrametric norm. It would satisfy that absolute value of S, S prime is the product of the two absolute values. And absolute value of S plus S prime will be less than the max of norm of S, norm of S prime. So because you are converting the properties of evaluations, evaluation into properties of an absolute value. And now we have this set here, H script H of L. So there are functions on the space of valuations. There are functions phi, which in fact are uh, continuous and bounded, except I, I forgot to mention the topology on the space of valuations. It's just the, the topology of pointwise convergence. On, so the evaluation V is a function on, on the function field of uh, X. And therefore, the X val has the natural topology of pointwise convergence. And now you have functions on X val, which are continuous with respect to this simple topology, and they are bounded. They have this special form. So they are, they are attached, they are made up from uh, the previous uh, functions, absolute value of S. But we move back again to additive notation. So this looks very silly if you don't have the uh, complex picture in mind, because you, you want to have a log of absolute value of a holomorphic function as a basic example of a PSH function in mind. If you don't, then this looks just stupid, going back and forth like that. But anyway, phi is basically a max of log of SI that you've translated by a constant. So we like these functions. Uh, so one reason we like them is that if you take differences of such functions and multiples, you get a Q vector space, which is denoted by PL with some index R because they are like real piecewise linear functions on the space of valuations. So the terminology piecewise linear, it really has a lot of substance uh, that uh, comes from Berkovich geometry. But in the toric case, for example, you would exactly get piecewise linear functions on R to the N if you restrict, if you require that everybody in the picture is toric. Uh, and well, this PL space is independent of L, in fact, and it's stable under mean max. Also, it separates points. So it's some sort of nice space of test functions. So in this uh, setting of spaces of valuations, these PL functions uh, are a good replacement for smooth functions that you would use in complex geometry, as it turns out. But of course, the product of PL functions is not PL. So here it's still on the max. It's more like a tropical algebra than a standard algebra. Uh, OK, and now, uh, now the thing is that <clears throat> if you have a filtration of finite type, so homogeneous if you want, then it's, it's a real test configuration, uh, you can attach to it a function, one of these Fubinish 2D functions by the formula that is written here. So you take into account the filtration and log of S, and you can show that this is realized by, uh, in fact, by, uh, it can be written as above if you choose SI to be a compatible basis for FM. And also it's independent of M divisible enough. This is a reflection of uh, the filtration being of finite type. So you get one of these Pubinich 2D functions attached to any finite type filtration. One thing we prove with Matthias in our a paper that is almost uh, complete by now, it's a revision of a, an older paper on the same subject, uh, it we proves uh, the following statement. So here on the left, you have the, the, the space of finite type homogeneous filtrations. Again, they are real test configurations. Uh, this has uh, its uh, D-infinity metric. And uh, to any such filtration, we have attached a function, uh, a Fubinich 2D function. And this, in fact, is one-to-one -one correspondence, and even better, an isometry with respect to the D infinity metric on the left, and the soup norm, usual soup norm metric. So I mean the metric, you know, the soup of the difference, that's what I mean, uh, on the right. So this is kind of nice. <clears throat> so in terms of D infinity, geomet D infinity geometry, Test configurations correspond to Fubinich 2D functions with the soup norm. Uh, okay, so now to explain uh, the similar picture, 
for the D1 metric, which is the one we are really interested in, I, I will introduce just a, a tiny little bit of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, pluripotential language. So let me mention PSH functions on the Berkovich space. So the Berkovich space itself, it's not such a big if you are used to the space of valuations, it's just to the space of valuation to which you add also valuations on every sub variety of X. So this you call a semi valuation because it becomes infinite somehow on functions that vanish on this sub variety. So it, be, it becomes infinite, not only on, on the zero function, but on many more functions. And uh, if you do that and you put a decent topology on, on it, which is not that difficult to describe, but I just prefer to skip it <clears throat> here. You get a natural compactification x n, which is the Berkovich compact and identification of x with respect to the trivial absolute value on k, and so it's a compact Hausdorff topological space in which x val sits as a dense subset. And uh, if you do that, uh, the PL functions we had before in actually extend in a continuous way to x n. So then, continuous functions on the whole of x n. Of course, they, they, it's a compact set, so they are bounded. So they induce continuous and bounded functions on x val. And the PL ones are, in fact, continuous on x n. And the fact that PL ones are continuous on x n uh, is a enables you, in the end of the day, to really reconstruct yeah, x n as a sort of uh, Gelfand spectrum of PL r. But sort of tropical Gelfand spectrum, if you want. So it's, it's, the two things are closely related. <clears throat> uh, and then you define uh, an LPSH function on Xn. So that would, that would correspond to a semi-positive, but maybe singular metric on L, except that in this setting, metrics and functions get confused uh, because there is always a canonical so-called trivial metric on any line bundle. So anyway, you can just use this function description. So a function on xn, which is possibly minus infinity on some points, uh, is LPSH if it's a decreasing limit of functions, of Fubinich 2D functions. So you, it's a sort of monotone, monotonic completion of H of L. So by Dini's lemma, if the, if the function you have phi happens to be already continuous on xn and finite values, then uh, this decreasing convergence of the net will, will be a uniform convergence. And because of that, you see that the space of continuous and PSH uh, functions on xn is just the closure of x of L uh, with respect to the uniform, with respect to uniform convergence. So the, the continuous PSH functions are exactly the uniform limits of Fubinich 2D functions. And, uh, and on the other hand, we've been looking before at the filtrations that were uniform limits in their own way, the infinity limits of finite type filtrations, so of test, config test configurations. And if you have such a quasi-finite type filtration F, you can play a game that resembles what we did before. So for each M, you, you get a function, a Fubinich 2D function by the same formula as before. And as before, this is, uh, this is realized. This, it's really a max and not a soup, and it's achieved by any choice of compatible basis. But now it does not uh, stabilize for M divisible enough because it's only quasi-finite type. But at least it will converge in the limit in the unit way to some function, which is therefore uh, continuous and LPSH as a uniform limit with two functions. So this way we attack quasi type filtration, a continuous PSH function. And then uh, from the we had before, so one slide before, finite type homogeneous, they correspond to AVL. And the infinity uh, corresponds to uh, the norm. And then you take the closure on both sides, get that quasi finite type and homogeneous filtration. They correspond exactly to these continuous sage functions. So it says that if, from the perspective of infinity geometry, the completion of the space 
T of test configurations is uh, embodied in this space of continuous and LPSH functions with the soup norm. Okay, so that's why I'm saying that these filtrations, which are quasi-finite type, they, they are more natural from this point of view than the, other, the general ones because they satisfy this kind of continuity property that are built that is built in. But from the filtration perspective, of course, you don't see it uh, in, in the beginning. If you just want to take any filtration. There, there's no reason to restrict to these to begin with. But in fact, general filtrations in this picture they will correspond to PSH functions which are bounded, but satisfy some very uh, subtle continuity property. So I don't think I mentioned it here, but uh, in the slides, but I can say it orally. They correspond to bounded PSH functions, which are quasi-continuous in the sense that the uh, discontinuity locus is uh, negligible from the perspective of pluripotential theory. So this is called a pluripolar set. So it's a bit like uh, uh, Riemann integrable functions within Lebesgue integrable ones. You know that the Riemann integrable ones, they are the Lebesgue integrable ones whose this continuity locus is negligible. And so the functions you get from arbitrary filtrations, they have the same sort of flavor. So they are a bit odd. You know that Riemann integrable functions they are not so convenient in integration theory. And so somehow you get the same sort of drawback by looking at arbitrary filtrations <clears throat> because of that. Okay, um, so I guess I'm going super fast or I didn't have that much to say, but this is actually the final slide, good news. Um, so here we make some extra assumptions <clears throat> because we need more refined technology from the point of view of algebraic geometry to state the following thing. So, so I'm going to talk about functions of finite energy, and this will be the D1 completion of the space of test configurations. So here we assume that X is smooth and the characteristic is zero. This is because uh, we use, well, guess what? <laughs> we use resolution of singularities, and also we use vanishing theorems. We use Kodaira type vanishing, or more precisely, nadal vanishing, and multiplier ideals in a crucial way. So in characteristic P, you could play the same game more or less with test ideals, um, but at least you, you need resolution of singularities. So in low dimension, you can play the same game. <clears throat> Um, so here is the result. I'm not being super specific here, so I'm just saying that the D1 completion of T, as opposed to the D infinity completion we just saw before, it's the stronger one. We get continuous PSH functions. They are bounded in particular. Uh, and the D1 completion, we get a different space, and it's a space that has been, so whose complex version in complex geometry has been used a lot. Uh, in relation to the study of uh, complex Mont Jean-Pierre equations and Keller-Einstein metrics and CSCK metrics and so on and so forth. So it's the space of uh, PSH functions of finite energy. I I'm not defining what the energy is, so you won't know what finite energy means here because it, it takes a little bit of formalism. But in fact, it fits in very naturally in this non-Archimedean situation with some of the invariants you, you see when you study case stability. Um, but, uh, okay, at least this uh, theorem here, it's, it's a complete analog, completely analogous to a, a result that was proved by uh, Tamaj Darvash uh, some years ago in the complex situation. So it was a conjecture of Vincent Gage that E1, space E1 that we had been work, um, studying and working on a lot with uh, Gage, Sariyayi, Berman, and so on, was in fact the D1 metric completion of the space of Keller potentials. So here you replace Keller potentials by test configurations, and the D1 completion is the space E1, the non orientation version, which are functions on the space of valuations. Okay, so why is all of that of any interest <clears throat> to case stability, <clears throat> except that you have, it could be fun to have various completions of the of test configurations, perhaps. Uh, so first of all, uh, using non archimedean pluripotential theory, which as opposed to what the title was announcing, doesn't show up very much as you can see in this talk, 
uh, you can define a certain functional, which is the exact analog of the Mabuchi K energy functional in the complex case. And it's defined on the space E1. Uh, well, it's lower semi-continuous with respect to a natural, well, the D1 metric, in fact, topology on E1. It can be infinite. And this Mabuchi functional, it's more or less the same, in fact, as the Donaldson Futaki invariant when you restrict to test configurations. So, this is the thing we pointed to uh, in our paper with Isamoto and Yonsan uh, some years ago. So, you can define a non Archimedean Mabuchi functional, and it's, it's more or less exactly like the DF functional, the DF invariants, except that they behave in a better way with respect to base change of the test configuration. So, it's a, some sort of homogenization, again, of the Donaldson Futaki invariant. But as far as testing case stability or uniform case stability is concerned, it doesn't make any difference at all. So uniform case stability is equivalent to the Mabuchi uh, functional being coercive. So it means it has this linear growth property with respect to the L1 norm on H of L, which is the space of test configurations. Uh, so this is equivalent. And we conjecture that it's also equivalent to uh, having the same condition on the whole space E1. But here, it's kind of tricky. Of, of course, one direction is fairly easy. You just restrict to H of L. But the other one, you need to approximate a function in E1. So some limit, D1 limit of test configurations by test configurations for which the Mabuchi, uh, along which the Mabuchi functional will be continuous. And the, the hard piece in the Mabuchi functional is the what we call the entropy, which is basically uh, the log discrepancy function, some average of the log discrepancy function. This is the log discrepancy function is a complicated function on the space of valuations. And so that part of the Mabuchi functional is very difficult to control when you try to approximate like that. But anyway, if we could do this, or if you want, if you redefine uniform case stability by replacing H of L with E1, I mean, you could do that, why not? It would be uniform, uniform case stability. Then uh, you have this very uh, impressive results, recent result of Chile that relies on part of the analysis in a very crucial way on the just as impressive, uh, slightly less recent result of uh, Shushong Chen and, uh, and Chen. Uh, which so that's in the complex case, of course, and X is still smooth, so X is a projective manifold polarized, and then you know the YTD conjecture, maybe. So YTD conjecture says that case stability uh, should be equivalent to the existence of a CSCK metric, constant scalar curvature scalar metric in this situation. So when L is minus KX or plus KX, CSCK is the same as scalar einstein metric, and then the conjecture uh, is, has been famously proved a number of times by various people. <coughs> uh, that we take the opportunity not to list here. Uh, okay, and then uh, what truly prove is some sort, some version of YTD in this general polarized case. So it proved that if you have this strong form of uh, uniform case stability, so not only on test configurations but on D1 limits of them, then uh, you have a CSCK metric. And here again, the, the converse. Uh, yeah, the, so for the converse, you also need this approximation. Uh, so I think conversely, if you have a CSCK metric, you get uniform case stability on the smaller set of test configurations and modulo this conjecture I mentioned about passing from H of L to E1. This would be an if and only if. And anyway, it would settle YTD in the general case. So that would be, of course, very nice. But, but, but the, the message here is that uh, all the analysis is done now. So, I mean, th this, is, this is the result. This is some version of YTD. Some algebra geometric condition on the left gives you a solution to a PDE on the right. And then the analysis is done. And what remains to do is a job for algebraic geometers to show that the condition on the left, which is stronger on the face of it than uniform case stability, is in fact equivalent. And that requires understanding the dog discrepancy function even better in the space of valuations. Okay, so I guess, uh, despite rumbling uh, around a lot on this slide, I'm already done. So thanks a lot for your attention. 
So let's thank Sebastian. And does anyone have any questions? Uh, I have sorry. Uh, may I ask some question? Sure. Uh, this Mabuchi something might be convex in some sense. Uh, so can you repeat the, the question, uh, sorry? Yeah, the, uh, the Mabuchi functional or something might be convex in some sense. I'm not familiar with that. But, uh, that that's a very good point, yes. So uh, I cannot say that the answer is yes uh, in the non archimedean case because uh, it's not proved yet, but certainly it's very much expected. Again, uh, the whole picture is built on an analogy with the much more understood picture in the complex case. So in the complex case, the K energy or Mabuchi functional is indeed convex, but in a very non-trivial sense, which is it involves this uh, curved uh, geometry, Riemannian geometry, Mabuchi geometry on the space of Keller potentials and uh, and, and it, its completion. So here it's the space E1. So you have this, this whole industry of studying geodesics in the space of Keller metrics and studying geodesics, weak geodesics in E1, they exist. So E1, D1 is, is a geodesic uh, metric space. And it's in fact, it's also complete under the assumption we made here that we can prove also in the non archimedean case. Well, because it's oh. a completion after all. <laughs> sure. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Yeah, so you have this, this non-trivial geometry in E1 and Mab the Mabuchi functional in the complex case is convex, but it's a very difficult result. I mean, it's quite non-trivial right, yeah. by Berman and Bernson and also uh, Shishong Chen and Nihai Paon and Long Li. And of course, we expect the same thing here. So we, we know how to construct geodesics in E1. So th this is something that uh, has been done by uh, my student uh, Rémi Reboulet quite recently, in fact, over an Indian non archimedean field. And then you expect convexity. That's, that's the next step. Right. Thank you very much. Welcome. I have small question. So, sure. so uh, the uniform case stability implies existence of metric, uh, for yeah. example, in low dimensions. For example, in dimension two, would it be easier to prove? Or? Uh, so what would be easier? I mean, this main if and only if statement, which you said, if you could just restate ah, okay. so the, this, to dimension two, for example. This, this conjecture that we have, <coughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, if, if I knew how to prove it in dimension two, uh, I would do it, but so, but I, I mean, to me, it doesn't look like dimension two is particularly easier, but, but it's true that, I mean, certainly from the point of view of rational geometry, it is simpler. Mm -hmm. So it should help, but, but I think we, yeah, We've been a bit lazy with this conjecture, not with this whole project, but the conjecture itself, we haven't tried to investigate it that hard for the moment. And uh, I'm pretty sure that the people who, who would be uh, able to do it uh, would be much more uh, at ease with uh, MMP techniques anyway. I mean, it's, it's mostly something about the log discrepancy. So you need people, I mean, you can imagine the kind of people who would do something like that these days. But anyway, so I, I don't know, but it's a good, it's a good point. Thank you. Dimension Thank you. one is okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, I think I missed some slide, but uh, oh, the yeah. previous. Yeah. Ah, hi. I can send so, them to you uh, afterwards if you want. Ah, thank you. So, uh, could you go back to this just previous slide? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so this T is just space of test configuration. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's and this is Chi this, I mean, the previous paper. I mean, and, uh, I mean the GOD6 and CSEK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the, ah, yeah, okay. yeah it's. I see, I see. <clears throat> okay, thank you. From, yeah, from last summer, I think, last mm -hmm. June or something like that. Yes. Third class question. Yes, please. So I, I think uh, in one of your papers, you defined this uh, space of non archimedean metrics to be the uh, equivalence class of test configurations by the uh, pullbacks. But has it been like always implicit in today's talk as well? Like, uh, did you identify two test configurations by pullback or did you? Um... Uh, so no, today I did something even smarter. <laughs> I just, I just uh, imposed uh, that test configuration 
uh, has an ample line bundle, then you, you cannot pull back. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. So it's a sort of unique representative in the equivalence class. So if you allow pullback, it's very convenient for various things because if you have two test configurations, they are just birationally equivalent. And of course, if you want to compare them, you want to pull back everybody to some higher one and you will lose ampleness. So I'm not saying that this point of view is bad. We still use it. But here, I think the ones that are, have the nicest properties, so they are, they are ample and normal. And these are the ones which are in one-to-one -one correspondence, the H of L. But it's also in one-to-one -one correspondence with equivalent classes of uh, semi-ample and maybe not normal test configurations, because they will always factor through one of these here. Thank very much, thank you. Are there any more questions? If not, let's thank Sebastian again, and we resume at 2.15. Uh, let's make a picture after oh, we yeah. think, Sebastian. Uh, let's That's, make a picture. Yeah. As well, oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, did you stop the recording, Vanya? No. Yeah. No, recording is on. I 